So uh, today we have our very own uh, Simon Devitt, who will give a, a seminar on the quantum sneaker net. And I guess you'll tell us what that is. Take it yeah, away. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, um, I suppose people yell at me if they want to interrupt me for a question, uh, but feel free to at any time. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the sneaker net, which is something that uh, we've sort of been um, playing around with for a number of years now as a potential methodology for distributing long range entanglement, something that people have been talking about in regards to sort of the, the global quantum internet, if such a thing if it becomes a, a reality in the future. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the other technologies and why we sort of came up with this, and then I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about how we envisage it working, what are some of the requirements for the technology that would be needed to implement this particular model of quantum communications. So just to start things off, um, let's just make a few points about, uh, about quantum comms. And really, what are we talking about in regards to how we assess a particular technology or how we're hoping a particular technology will work? Well, there's really five key metrics, uh, sorry, four key metrics, namely rate, you need to be fast, um, range, if you're talking about a quantum internet, you're clearly talking about something that's global, uh, not local, um, fidelity, um, because QKD is not the only application. Um, you are talking about potentially connecting quantum computers together, um, which requires high fidelity. And probably the most important metric, which is cost, um, because we're going to build more than one connection, right? This is going to be a quantum internet. So we really need to consider how much do things cost, what are the potential hurdles in regards to technology deployment, technology maintenance, um, everything that we run into in the classical side. So all of these things need to be considered and everything battles to each other. Um, you want it to be fast, it can't go very far. You want it to be high fidelity, it can't go that fast. Um, often when you're talking about repeaters or satellites, they're gonna cost a lot. Um, even if it is practical to deploy a network of these things, which I'm going to argue in a little bit that it's not entirely practical to do so. And so some other things that I see happening within the, the quantum communication space that I kind of wish would stop is first of all, and this is the big one, don't conflate applications. Quantum key distribution is not what makes a quantum internet and stop pretending that it does. Um, if you have a key distribution network, that's great. But the requirements of quantum key distribution is not the same as the requirements of potential quantum internet connecting quantum computers together. Um, I see this happening quite a lot that the key distribution channel is formulated or demonstrated and we're all talking about quantum internets. It's a whole different thing. Um, entanglement distribution is pretty much next to useless if it's not occurring at a high rate. Um, and this sort of couples in to the next couple of points is that high rates does not necessarily mean terahertz. It doesn't need to be the same speed um, as a classical internet but it certainly doesn't mean Hertz. And Hertz is kind of what we're seeing at the moment uh, in regards to a lot of these models, even in a theoretical sense, let alone the practical sense. So quantum, also nobody will invest in quantum communications. It only reaches the guy down the street. Um, clearly you want this thing to go long distance. You want to connect either intra countries or intercontinental in order to do key distribution, other quantum communications protocols. It's no point if it's going from here to across the road or here down the street. Uh, deployment and maintenance costs are certainly not something to be ignored, especially when you talk about things at scale. Um, and this links into whether or not, and this is not just relevant for quantum communications, it's also relevant for quantum computing. There has to be a sort of a decision if quantum technology is, what do you envisage it to be? Is it to be a ubiquitous technology, like classical? Is it gonna be everywhere? Or is it going to be another LHC or LIGO where it's going to cost tens of billions of dollars and we're really only going to build one of them? So this comes back into the cost question, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, that is not overly well studied at this point. Um, the technology does need to be flexible on mobile. Fixed ed exit nodes or telescopes in order to, to receive quantum technology doesn't do much good. Um, 
just like the classical internet really wouldn't be working the way it works now if everything needed to ultimately be plugged into a wall. And trusted node models, which is what everyone's using at the moment in regards to sort of quantum key distribution, kind of destroys the entire point of doing quantum communications. Now, most people understand this, they're gonna move away from it as the technology develops. But at the moment, especially say with the Chinese networks, whether it's the satellite network or the fiber network, um, it's still trusted node based, um, which kind of yeah, misses the point. So to emphasize some of this stuff, we did some work back in 2008. Um, this was just after we uh, did a paper on um, a topological, uh, topologically error corrected based atom optics quantum computer. And then we sort of said, well, okay, let's try and expand this further and say, well, okay, what's the, the sort of quantum version of a high performance quantum computing model? Um, and we talked about two models in this paper um, that kind of fell into the gutter, which was a bit unfortunate, but nevertheless. Um, we talked about sort of the cloud based um, quantum computing model. Um, which is what people are, are mostly looking at now in regards to IBM, where you have a classical description of your circuit, you send that classical description to a server, the server simply runs it and gives you back the answers. But we also talked about sort of the secure version, where in this particular case, because it was an atom optics based architecture, so all the qubits are, are photons, that you literally took a giant Rausendorf lattice, which is sort of the, the way in optics you would run the surface code. Um, the 3D lattice model, where you would take uh, a sort of subsection of that lattice, it's still quite large, and you would physically pipe it to a user. So if you want to talk about this in the context of, of Joe Ann and Elham's um, sort of blind quantum computing model, this is the Alice is the receiver model, where Alice receives a stream of photons from a server and has the ability to do uh, arbitrary single photon measurement. Um, so in this particular case, you would take a subsection of the lattice and you would pipe it through to the user and the user would measure it to do their own quantum computation, even though they don't have quantum hardware. Now, this obviously required a huge amounts of routing. This required a huge quantum communications channel um, that could pipe potentially millions of photons, arbitrary distances around the globe at potentially megahertz to gigahertz rates with fidelities greater than 99.9%. So these are the requirements that you need if we're really talking about a quantum internet. We need megahertz to gigahertz, long range, fidelity is greater than 99.9%, and obviously it doesn't cost the GDP of the United States in order to build. So when we sort of described this model, we said, you know, unfortunately the demands of a quantum internet are more than likely gonna be much, much higher than the demands uh, on a single quantum computer. So what do we have now? Um, well, we have three main technologies that have been built that I'm sure everyone's heard of. Uh, quantum repeating systems, um, which are basically fiber optics based, um, where you use uh, entanglement distillation, entanglement swapping through intermediate nodes to establish long range bell states end to end. Uh, you've got the quantum satellites, um, most notably the Chinese ones, but obviously there are others that are much, much smaller. Um, the Singaporeans have launched one, um, the Canadians are working on one, uh, the Japanese have launched one, um, but much, much smaller than the, than the Chinese one, and it doesn't distribute uh, entangled photon pairs, whereas uh, the Chinese mozzie platform does. Uh, and then you've got free space. So these are the experiments that uh, Anton Zeilinger's group and the other people at the University of Vienna have been doing for, for many, many years now uh, on the uh, Canary Islands, just off the coast of Africa. Um, where they were looking at quantum key distribution uh, links over about 150 kilometers and sort of line of sight free space. Um, free space is not overly used much anymore. In fact, it was more of a precursor to satellites um, in order to sort of study atmospheric attenuation, how you could actually beam a particle of photons through free space from a sender to a receiver. Most of the technology that was developed in the free space stuff um, has been utilized to make quantum satellites a bit better. So what's the problem with both of these technologies really? Um, and it's one word, it's attenuation. Um, whether it's caused by fiber or whether it's caused by the atmosphere, it just kills you at the quantum level. Um, the loss rates are intolerable. 
And because in quantum, we're talking about a particle stream here, it's not like uh, classical satellite communications or classical fiber optics communications where you can just pump a dirty great big signal um, either through the atmosphere or through the fibers, deal with repeaters to amplify that signal um, and you can get over the fact that you lose the vast vast majority of photons from sender to receiver at the quantum level this is just really a problem um, because you obviously need an individual particle to make it um, from start to finish and both fiber attenuation and atmospheric attenuation is really, really a problem. Now, that to be said, there are protocols. Okay, can I interrupt? Yeah. yeah. Um, is, is that independent of the, I guess, in this case, the wavelength or type of photon that you, or type of encoding that you're trying to use? Uh, in terms of wavelength, attenuation is highly dependent on wavelength, but both in the fiber optics case and the atmospheric case, um, you tune to make sure you're using so in the case of satellites they use wavelengths that the atmosphere is most transparent to right okay um in terms of coding structures well th this is all you know repeaters and, and error correction in the quantum communication space is designed to get over um is this uh, this issue of, of finite attenuation and quite short range attenuation when you think about it um even though we have fiber optics crisscrossing the planet um, the attenuation length of the best fiber optics in the world is not great. It's only about 50 to 100 kilometers. And even though that there's a huge amount of reasons to make fiber optics more efficient, um, it has not happened yet. So maybe nature's just not going to cooperate. And as for satellites, there's nothing you can do about the atmosphere, unfortunately. Um, you know, I'm sure there are certain people who are doing the technology that would like to get rid of it, but uh, that might cause problems. So in the, the context of repeaters, a massive amount of work has been done um, theoretically and architecturally in relation to quantum repeater models and what kind of performance you can expect to see. Um, I still think this paper from Austin and, and David Charles, Thaddeus Rod Lloyd, it still represents uh, probably one of the better models um, that have come up over the years, but it still has obvious issues. So what this model does is it simply treats your entire communication link as a single long rectangular surface code and just runs it as if you're running a computation. So what you do is you have a square patch. You can see in the figure on the left, you have a square patch that's your source, so Alice. So it's a, a square patch, a logically encoded qubit in the surface code. Your receiver is a, similarly another square patch. And then the intermediate, part of the surface code you chop up into columns and each of these columns represents a repeater and you simply treat the bonds between qubits in these columns as very lossy very higher rate within the surface code um, and you form a communications channel that's error corrected in this way now they did performance and analysis on this what you could expect and it's not great so First of all, it's what's called a ballistic model. So the logical qubit is literally shot down this channel. Um, you don't establish end-to-end -end entanglement because if you do that, you, your rates drop through the floor because the whole idea is, you know, I'm gonna send a logical qubit down this error corrected channel and the second it leaves Alice, I'm sending another one. And this is how you can get high rates in this model. But unfortunately, it does not generate final end-to-end -end entanglement it's a ballistic model um, the optimistic rates that they came up with was about a megahertz end-to-end -end across a thousand kilometers so not global distances um, not particularly high rate and this had some pretty stringent assumptions on the hardware um, it assumed a physical gate time with the hardware that makes up the quantum repeaters of two nanoseconds no hardware runs that fast um, and you're required on the order of 10 to the three, so anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 physical qubits per repeater to do the job. And probably the largest problem um, with quantum repeaters is their physical separation. For these high rate error corrected models to even work, you need to be with the, within the attenuation length of optical fiber. So the repeater has separations have to be on the order of about 20 to 30 kilometers. 
So now you have these quantum repeaters with a thousand to 10,000 qubits in them. So they are mini quantum computers effectively that have to be separated by 20 kilometers across the Pacific Ocean. That creates all kinds of headaches when it comes to whether that's even possible to do, um, to put these things over long distance links, either terrestrially or over the oceans. Um, and even then they don't perform that well um, in regards to their final rates um, and their final fidelities. So satellites, um, there's been obviously a lot of experimental work um, showing that you can transmit entangled photon pairs from a satellite to a ground station um, for entanglement based QKD protocols or just a single particle stream of photons or weak coherent states to do uh, something like BB84 QKD. Unfortunately, unlike repeaters, there's not much um, in terms of formulating a fully error corrected model of satellite based um, quantum communications. So I, making the direct comparisons to the repeater systems are a bit difficult because quite frankly, there's no good models out there as to how you do fully error corrected systems. Um, the best sort of results that have come out recently in terms of some kind of performance analysis of a global system um, is this result from just before last Christmas um, from John's group at Louisiana, where they looked at a potential satellite constellation um, for a quantum internet. Now, again, this gets back to a point I raised earlier, quantum key distribution is not a quantum internet. Um, however, this is what they're looking at is QKD, even though they talk about uh, a quantum internet. So they look at different models about sort of the, the altitude of the satellites and how many satellites you need to cover the earth. Um, but what the numbers that I pulled out uh, are basically the ones that give you the highest rate. So at a low earth orbit of about 500 kilometers, which is about the altitude that the, the Chinese quantum satellite was launched into. They said that you need about 400 satellites um, to provide global coverage um, in order to distribute entangled photon pairs. And at that altitude of 500 kilometers, at a ground separation of your base stations of about 2000 kilometers, their theoretical models predict an end-to-end -end rate of about 800 Hertz at about 97% fidelity. Now, again, this is not great. Um, at 97% fidelity, the only thing you really can do is QKD. If you wanna boost that fidelity in order to prepare bell states that could possibly be used um, to help distribute actual quantum information that could be error corrected, um, you've got to do distillation or some other kind of purification protocol. There is no actual hardware on the satellites themselves except for an entangled photon source. There's no sort of mini quantum computer sitting on these satellites. So everything has to be done on the ground. Um, if you start off with 800 Hertz and you start trying to purify through entanglement distillation, that's going to drop to sub Hertz. Um, and of course, with satellites and with any sort of quantum uh, communication technology that's free space, it's extremely easy to disrupt. Unlike classical satellites, it's not, you know, a broad wave fund, powerful e-impulse. You know, if you think of GPS, GPS is 33 satellites that can serve as billions of devices with their signals. Quantum satellites are a particle stream. So the easiest, you know, if I want to block it, I hold a piece of cardboard up and that's it. I just disabled a hundred million dollar satellite. Um, they're very, very easy to block and they don't service multiple users um, in the same sense that classical satellites do. So that 800 Hertz still is just two individual users that can use the network at any one time. And obviously then there's the cost. So if you take the, the Chinese satellite as a, as a quintessential example, it was a payload of, of over half a ton um, and launched into a 500 kilometer low Earth orbit. And based on at least commercial prices as they existed at the time, obviously you don't know exactly how much the Chinese government paid for it, um, but based on commercial prices, that's about a $50 million launch cost, um, irrespective of the development of the hardware itself, um, what it costs to actually build that payload, just sticking it up there into space is about $50 million based on commercial prices. Um, and it's basically an entangled photon source um, with optics. The ground stations um, had to be highly elevated telescopes because obviously the atmosphere gets denser as you get closer to sea level 
and that's what killed you. So you stick the telescopes as high as you can in order to get your rates up. Again, not particularly something that's uh, amenable to a large uh, long distance networking structure. So again, just to bring it back, you have to really think about how you're trading off these four things and whether it makes sense to trade one off for the other, depending on ultimately what you want to do with the technology. So because of these issues, we were thinking of a potentially different model um, for providing long range global entanglement distribution for communications. And we went back to this old idea. Um, everyone understands the concept, even though few people know the name, um, which is called a sneak in it. And it's, it's simple, everyone does it. You create a communications channel by having some kind of memory and you just physically transport it from one place to the other. So the picture on the left here is, a, is an old picture from the 50s, I think. This is a five megabyte IBM hard drive that's being loaded into a Pan Am cargo hold. So, you know, that's one song on Spotify. So th this was done back in the old days and it's still done now. Sneak and it's are extensively used today for any application that has high data sets and you don't have to worry about time. So Hollywood uses it quite extensively. So they might have, you know, petabytes of raw footage. So one of the examples that I put in here is Peter Jackson when he was doing the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, you know, they would have petabytes of raw footage coming from New Zealand and it'd have to go to Los Angeles to go through CGI and editing and whatnot. Well, they didn't use the classical internet. They just bought a whole bunch of hard drives and FedEx them from New Zealand to, to um, the United States. So this is used quite a lot. And classical hard drives in terms of cost per mem uh, gigabyte or cost per, per megabyte are unbelievably cheap. So for example, Amazon has, a, I think it's a 15 terabyte Hitachi hard drive now for $400. Now, you know, all of us have our classical internets at home. My personal one's limited to one terabyte a month and we use about half of it. So this one hard drive that costs $400 basically has two years of our internet consumption as capacity. So hard drives are extremely, extremely cheap. Now, given that, why do we still spend half a million dollars or a million dollars, oh, sorry, not that much, billions of dollars, I should say, building fiber optic lines, putting up satellite constellations for the classical internet. It's because of latency. Classical sneaker nets are limited by the amount of time to physically move the hard drive from point A to point B. That does us little good in terms of real-time communications. So I can't use real-time logins to Netflix or my bank account if I would have to wait, you know, 10 or 12 days for somebody to pick up the hard drive, fly it halfway around the world and plug it into a different server. So obviously we can't build real-time communication systems using classical sneaker net techniques, simply because we're gonna get killed by latency. Now, before I get onto sort of the sneaker net itself for quantum and what quantum sneaker net does is basically solve this latency problem. So there is no latency issue when it comes to the quantum sneaker net. I just wanna step back a little bit and sort of say, a little bit about the hardware and how you would build sort of quantum version of memory sticks, because that's what all of this is based on. Um, can I have a long lived quantum memory um, that's portable that I can ship around the world and treat like a USB stick? So when we first started looking at the sneaker net idea, we'd just come off uh, working on a quantum computing architecture for Diamond that we did in collaboration with the, with the group in Vienna. And at the time, we quite liked this model uh, in terms of a large scale quantum computer. And this was for three reasons. And this is also the three reasons why we think it's actually quite useful as a potential quantum memory stick to use as a backbone for this sort of sneaker net technology, for this, this communication system. And there's three points in the technology that's quite useful. First of all, Diamond is optically accessible. So, with uh, a nitrogen vacancy center, as you may or may not know, you replace one of the carbon atoms in the diamond lattice with the nitrogen. Sitting next to that carbon atom is a vacancy, basically one of the carbons that was there in the diamond gets kicked out, there's basically a hole. And then there's a valence electron that sort of orbits the nitrogen and this vacancy. This electron is optically accessible. There is a, a, a transition there that occurs at optical frequencies. 
um, for the electron, and the electron has a partner nucleus uh, in the nitrogen. So the electrons actually spin one system, so it's a three level system, and the nitrogen nucleus is a, a spin half, so it's a qubit. Diamond actually works at four Kelvin. So diamond does not need to be cooled to millikelvin temperature, so it doesn't require dilution refrigeration. Uh, there are some people who talk about diamond being a potential room temperature quantum computer. I don't believe that um, in the sense that while qubits will work in diamond at room temperature, it's not something that uh, is going to satisfy the fidelities of fault tolerant error correction if you're running that hot. So it does need to run at four Kelvin, but four Kelvin helium prior stats are ubiquitous. They don't cost that much and they are portable. We launch them into space. Um, in order to cool uh, infrared cameras um, on space telescopes. And thirdly, there's no vacuums in diamond. Um, there is a spin vacuum provided by the, the diamond lattice itself, but you're not like iron traps actually building a, a physical vacuum system uh, in order to keep, keep the qubits isolated. So we thought of this as a potentially interesting technology for computing in a highly distributed model. So in this particular system, each individual qubit in our quantum computer is completely separated from each other. There's no direct coupling. Um, as far as the, the NV qubits are concerned, they should be on the other side of the universe. And you use the optical interface in order to, with very, very low probability, optically couple the electrons of two NVs together. So it's a highly probabilistic model um, of coupling. Um, even in the theoretical, uh, um, assuming everything experimental is perfect, the theoretical limit for the optical connection is only 12.5%. And when you take experimental imperfections into account, this drops to sub 1% probability of success um, for the optical connection to work. But because of the existence of the nucleus uh, associated with the NV center, that's not a problem. You don't run into this issue that linear optics has where they have you know, probabilistic gates and you have to grow graph states and it just becomes a nightmare. Because you have this um, nitrogen nucleus that sits attached to each electron and you have deterministic coupling between those two subsystems, you can use the nucleus as a shunt. So this is also referred to as brokered graph states. So what happens is you have this highly probabilistic connection. You just repeat, repeat, repeat until you get a confirmed bond. So in this particular case with the, the NV center for this architecture, um, we assumed a collective probability of 1% that the electron, electron connection succeeds. So you would need approximately 100 attempts before on average you'll see a successful connection. And then once the bond is, con uh, once the connection is established, once you've got a bell state between these two electrons, you use the internal hyperfine interaction between the respective nuclei of these electrons and you shunt the bond to the nucleus and this protects it so that you can then use the electrons again have repeat until success connections and establish your next bonds so this makes all the difference in the world when it comes to being able to grow large universal graph states for quantum computing um, when people ask i sometimes uh, analogize with the the coin flipping idea so if you have 100 coins and the idea is well how long does it take you to get all heads Linear optics is trying to flip all the coins at the same time, and hopefully they all land on heads, which as you know, is exponentially small probability of that happening. When you use brokered graph states, these ideas of having a shunt, it's like taking each coin individually and keep flipping it until that one turns heads and then you set it aside. And as you know, in that particular case, it doesn't take you very long at all for all your coins to end up being heads. So in this particular hardware model, we benchmarked it out. We said, okay, what are the, the time scales we're talking about in regards to NV? So for a 1% connection probability, you need on average 100 connection attempts. Um, for the NV center, this takes about three microseconds. So if you can get your optics better and you can use a slightly different optical protocol, you could in principle get this to 100%. Um, so this means that our gate range with NV is somewhere between three microseconds and 100 nanoseconds, because 100 nanoseconds is as fast as the natural interaction time the NV allows for. So this would give you a physical cycle rate for the Rausendorf lattice or the, the surface code in this model of somewhere between 47 kilohertz and 1.6 megahertz. So it's not an ultra fast quantum computing model. 
it's not as slow as ion traps, but it's not as fast as superconductors, sort of sits in the middle, um, which is fine. And we benchmarked out, obviously, the error performance, um, did standard threshold analysis for the Rausendorf code, which is 0.73%. Uh, um, so that's your fault tolerant threshold, so all your physical error rates have to be below that. And then we looked at where the current experimental numbers are now um, and where they could hopefully be in the near future um, across a whole bunch of different error channels, uh, decoherence times for the nucleus, um, decoherence times for the electrons, measurement error rates, rotation error rates, um, the last one there on the right hand plot is called timing resolution. This is actually quite important um, when it comes to controlling uh, the interaction between electrons and nuclei. Everything has to be clocked very, very well to make sure errors don't spread. Um, but our argument at the time was that uh, Diamond is, is fairly close to being able to realize uh, this particular model. Unfortunately, because Diamond's been uh, touted as a, as a very good platform for magnetometry and quantum sensing, there's not many people in the world doing it right now um, as a quantum computing model. Um, so most of this stuff, uh, these, these numbers and these systems that I'm showing you is, is coming from Michael Trubke uh, at the University of Vienna. So in this particular case, his system is that you have a wafer of diamond um, that you dope, you do iron implantation. Um, so it's not atomically precise, but it doesn't need to be because we're not looking at direct interactions between the diamond centers. So what you do is you dope it. So this is figure A, um, where he's looking at different intensities of the doping. So no NV centers all the way up to like five or six. They're the really bright spots. Um, and each of the separations is about two microns between the two. And then you come in, you scan where your NVs are, you find the ones that are active, uh, the ones that are lined up properly um, with relation to an external magnetic field. And then you build these cavity systems around them. So these are, these are cantilever cavities. So you have this uh, basically cantilever that with voltage controls can be positioned with p uh, picometer um, accuracy. This is to make sure that you can tune your cavity resonance to the NV center. And then the NV center or the diamond wafer uh, sits at the bottom of an optic fiber. And this is how you get the interactions between the two. And then you plug the fiber optics in and then you in principle can connect any qubits to any other qubits. So this potentially leads to a, a, a quite a massively distributed system. Um, physically, it's very, very large. Um, in the diamond model, we're talking about qubit separations of about a quarter of a millimeter. Um, so for you know, a single atom qubit, it's actually very, very large when you think of their mean separation. But we're not concerned about that at the moment. Having a large quantum computing system is perfectly fine if it works. Um, and considering that there's no dilution refrigeration systems or vacuum systems, we think this is preferable and from an engineering point of view, a lot more doable because as I said, they're all sitting in four Kelvin helium cryostats and they're all optically connected to each other. So this was the model that we first thought about with regards to the, these active quantum memory units. Now, what a lot of people forget or don't realize is, is just how powerful the exponential scale of quantum error correction is. You actually can get quite a lot out of it. Now, other people are looking at sort of more intrinsic memory. So Matt Sellers at ANU does a lot of work on rare earth uh, dope crystals as sort of having intrinsically long coherence times. This is what we would call a passive quantum memory. Um, that work is interesting, although I, I haven't been convinced yet that it could actually work in this context, not because the memory itself is imprecise or, or bad, but because loading information in or out occurs at high error rates. So while the memory itself is really, really good, I can't get stuff in and out of it reliably um, in order to build you know, a useful memory that could actually be used in this context for a sneak in it. Whereas with error correction, it's precisely what quantum computers do. And this is the other benefit we think of this particular model is that the underlying hardware structures are identical to quantum computers. We're not building anything new. The only thing we need is for it to be portable. Um, and portability in this sense is very loose. It doesn't have to be something I can carry around. It needs to be something I could stick conceivably on the back of a semi-trailer. That level of portable would be sufficient. But otherwise, we're just building what quantum computing people are building. We're building surface code error corrected memory units. 
Now, the exponential scaling of these things, so this, this is a figure here where you know, the surface code has obviously been studied to death. Um, we know exactly how it performs in regards to what its threshold is and what its effective logical error rate is um, at low physical error. So in this particular case, the left-hand column says, okay, we're gonna take a square surface code patch just for memory. We're not doing computation on this of 10 by 10 up to 55 by 55 uh, qubits. The middle column is based on the NV model that we had. So a quarter of a millimeter pitch between each physical qubit. How big is that actual chipset? Um, so it's anywhere between 2.5 mil up to about 1.3 centimeters, 1.4 centimeters. And what is the effective memory time of that unit? So what is the logical failure rate of that error corrected system um, based on the diamond model? So if you push all the way up to a lattice of 55 qubits, which is a heavily error corrected memory unit, it pushes the effective memory time of this system up to 13 years. And this continues to scale exponentially. So if I was to go to 60 by 60, it'd be something like four or five decades. Um, so you can get really, really good performance out of this for a moderate number of qubits. So the one that I highlight in green is when we cross what we're sort of tentatively calling the macroscopic time scale boundary, which is a second or 10 seconds, really. It's when do you start getting memories that are good enough that I can start doing stuff with it on sort of human time scales. So once I get to about 10 seconds, you know, I could build a memory unit and I could move it into the next room without it um, failing. If you push it up to 2000 qubits, well, now I've pushed the memory time to nearly a week and now we can start playing some games because now I've got enough memory time to move it a long way. You know, I could, if it's portable enough and I could stick it on a truck or a plane, in five days, I could get it anywhere on earth. And if you want to do it slower, if you want to do it by cargo ship, which was our original model, if you go up to 2,500 physical qubits per memory unit, you're at 22 weeks of effective memory time, which means you could stick it on a boat and you could take it anywhere you wanted to. So, uh, Simon, the actual cell, yeah. Um, so back to the last slide, these chips are including single qubit using this uh, many qubits, is that correct? Yeah, so the column on the left is a single logical qubit. How many physical qubits is it? Okay. So it's basically one memory cell um, of your, okay. your quantum hard drive or your quantum memory stick. But like, so uh, I have uh, multiple logical qubits that like, the chip would grow linearly or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is what the next slide is. We, okay. So this is a cell. So this is an individual logical qubit cell. And then you break, you blow that up and you build what is effectively a quantum memory unit okay. that consists of many cells. So if you go back to this figure, so let's say we take the uh, uh, 10 by 10 mil chip. So that's 2,025 qubits. So that's a centimeter by centimeter chip with an effective memory time of five days. So the question is, okay, in a helium cryostat, something that's portable, how many can you fit in there? So if I start with a centimeter chip, if you take some of the commercial helium cryostats that are available, they're about the size of a reasonably large coffee machine. Um, they've got a sample chamber that could fit potentially a hundred cells in this particular technology model. So you could think of a hundred, you know, on the order of a hundred logical qubits in something about the size of a, co a, a large coffee machine. Um, and even that's large enough to start playing some interesting games. So the quantum memory unit itself in the diamond model we liked because it's potentially able to be physically portable, um, allowing you to actually move the entanglement that's generated. Uh, as I said, the ideal candidate that we think is, is color centers because they operate at four Kelvin, don't need vacuums, have a certain level of motional stability because again, the crystal locks in the NV center and is optically accessible. Its stability is provided by active error correction. So these are active units. They're not, you know, this is the other difference with classical hard drives. Classical hard drives are passive. You load them, switch them off, put them in a box. Obviously with the quantum version, this is an active unit. Stuff is happening in the machine all the time to preserve the information. Um, but with active error correction, you can preserve it for days, if not years, which opens up a tremendous flexibility in the communications application. 
And when you think of a distribution model based on these memory units, things get very interesting in regards to infrastructure because aside from the units themselves and how many you can build and at what cost, there is no other infrastructure. The other infrastructure already exists. Shipping channels already exist, whether by boat, whether by plane, whether by truck. So if I have a communications link, say, between here and Melbourne, and Perth wants to get in on the game, well, I'm not building this huge fiber optic repeater system across the Nullarbor, or I'm not tasking a satellite or potentially even launching a new satellite to get that kind of coverage. If I've got a certain number of these units sitting on a truck, I take some of them, put them in a different truck, and suddenly I've added a new city to my quantum communications network. And the same occurs on a global scale. Provided I build enough of these units, I can send them anywhere I want. So my communications network is only limited by the classical shipping logistics that already exists. So it's based on sneak and net principles, <clears throat> but as you may have already figured out, we solve the biggest problem with classical sneak and nets. There is no latency problem with quantum sneak and nets because we're not distributing information. We're distributing bell states. We're distributing entanglement. So the initial distribution of these bell states can take as long as you want. It can take a month, could take a year to get it from plate point A to point B, provided your memories are good enough to maintain that entanglement. When it gets to its destination, then you couple it in to your information and you use teleportation protocols. So provided you use the classical internet as the, the side channel for teleportation protocols, you have a latency of your quantum sneak in it that can match the latency of your fiber internet. And that's a huge difference in the case of quantum versus classical and the sneak net. As I've said, the flexibility, because we're physically shipping these memory units, communications channels are only limited by where a truck, a ship or a plane can go. We don't need um, capital intensive infrastructure to connect another country or connect another region. And because these memory units, you know, with a modest number of qubit overhead, um, can reach memory times of days or weeks, we have global reach. We can get anywhere on the planet within a couple of days if we're willing to ship it via air. And if we're gonna ship it via sea, which is higher capacity, we can get anywhere on the planet within about a month. So the network really can go anywhere that you want. So how specifically would this work for an application? Um, so let's take cryptographic key. So let's go back to key distribution um, as a model. It's actually not the lowest resource model that you can use with this. Um, the lowest resource cost is actually authentication tokens based on Bell's theorem. That actually requires the fewest number of these units to do the job. Um, symmetric key distribution, QKD, is sort of next on the list. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how you switch from one application to another in this model. So first of all, you charge your QMU. So in the diamond model, um, we have optical interfaces with each of our physical qubits in the system. And the physical qubits in the diamond model don't care whether it's connecting to another NV center that's sitting right next to it on the same chip, or if it's connecting to an NV sitting in a different cryostat that's sitting next to it. It doesn't matter because at most we're talking an extra meter of optic fiber. We're not running into attenuation length problems with the optic fiber. So the actual hardware doesn't care what it's connected to. So I start off with two of these units and you can imagine that there's a fiber optic bundle that comes out of each of them. And I just connect them together. And I do standard lattice surgery protocols on the surface code and I create a bunch of bell states at home. Once I've loaded the bell states on, I disconnect the two units. The internal error correction is meant to preserve that bell state for however long it's designed to. And I take these two units and I ship them off. So each QMU, each memory unit contains hopefully many, each of, of, of these cells. Um, our initial estimates suggest about 100 per memory unit, but you could imagine as systems uh, get miniaturized, the capacity could grow and grow. You then obviously ship, ship them off. You start sticking these things in trucks, in planes or whatever, and send them off to whatever destination you're interested to, you know, whichever two parties you're worried about, um, generating a key between. We'll get a unit that is entangled with a partner unit that may be somewhere else. So they're deployed out. Um, 
and they can go where any, anywhere that the actual units can be physically transported to. So this is another benefit we think of this model is that the receiving stations are not technology intensive fixed node points. Um, if you talk about a system that is about the size of a, a coffee can or even a larger sort of subsystem, they could be put on trucks, they could be put on planes, they could be put on boats um, to provide an actual endpoint for your key distribution, something that you can't really do with satellites and you certainly can't do with repeaters. Um, you can't have them on mobile platforms. So keep in mind that while all this is happening from a security point of view, there is no cryptographic keys. None of that information exists yet because we're still just shipping entanglement. We also have, and this is some of the work that we're doing right now, um, you can start playing multi-node networking games because yes, in the sort of simplest case, you're just, just distributing bell states, but you could imagine distributing much more complex graph structures because you can create anything you want at home. You can create any kind of substructure you want, secret sharing, a universal resource for quantum computation. You could pre you know, prepare a cluster state and send out each node in the cluster state somewhere. And even once these things have arrived at their locations, if they interact again, they come into close physical proximity again, you can create further bonds. So you can play some interesting multi-node games in terms of networking structures and, and possibly finding um, sort of optimized quantum graphs that would allow you to do some interesting uh, protocols that, that haven't been considered much before. So the entanglement network is formed. In this particular case, we're just talking about two-party bell states that are going to be used for QKD generation. Um, but this <clears throat> obviously happens over potentially global distances. Um, one unit could be 100 meters down the road, or it could be on the opposite side of the planet. And the capacity or the number of logical qubits in each unit is just simply a function of how big the units are, how many memory cells you can fit into it, and ultimately what you need for your application. So how much key material do you need to actually generate once you take into consideration that you'll, you know, you'll lose half of it for reconciliation. Um, and that's about it really, because remember these are highly error corrected units. So the classical error correction and privacy amplification side of QKD is not actually needed with these things because you assume you're dealing with ultra, ultra highly pure bell states. Um, whereas those people who work in QKD know, a lot of the classical side of QKD is to overcome the fact that you have low fidelity bell states to begin with. In this particular case, you again set the fidelity you want. If I want 10 nines of fidelity at some memory time, I just make my memory cells bigger. And that'll take me up to 10 nines fidelity and I don't have to worry about doing this other classical stuff. So if you want to generate 500, yeah. So I guess the when you're talking about reconciliation, I, I, is that um, you're talking there about the uh, the security confirmation part of the protocol. So, like, obviously, if if if, if um we have uh, quantum well, reconciliation is the ink. the half of the half of the states that you lose because you're doing random measurements on each side, and half the time you won't have done the same measurement. That's reconciliation. Yeah. Uh, okay, but uh, so so I guess then, um, I, I guess what I'm talking about then is, uh you want to use some, in terms of privacy amplification and so forth, part of that is um, to be able to, as a receiver, so to confirm that you're talking with the right people. Um, so for example, um, uh, if you've got, you know, quantum sneaker net, sneaker net Inc is, is distributing uh, these QMUs to two different users who want to create a secret um, cryptographic key between them, then they need to be able to verify that they're actually talking to the right people. And, and one, I presume one straightforward way to do that would just be to do bell violation tests on their qubits uh, in their units and communicate classically. Do you have a sense yeah. of how much the loss that is that an extra factor of 50% or how much do you lose that way? Well, um, this is something I mentioned before. <clears throat> Authentication tokens are actually the lowest resource things you need to do, irrespective of whether you do QKD on top. So if you want to do a bell violation with these units up to a confidence of six nines, so I, I want to be able to violate the bell inequality, you need about 50 units distributed over each partner. So about 50 logicals, 50 cells, I should say. So half a, half a QMU, if, 
we're talking about yeah. hundred cells per QMU. If I have 50 of them, so 25 for Alice, 25 for Bob, and they're ultra pure, so four nines of fidelity, I can violate a bell inequality up to four nines with 25 each. So yes, right. that would be an additional overhead to first okay. do the verification. And then that, and that basically establishes the authentication session. And then you can use the rest of the material to actually generate the key. But I mean, it's the same order of magnitude. It's still only a, a small, like a maybe losing 50% at most of, of the qubits that you're sending. So it's, it's a small, it's a smallish overhead. Yeah. And I mean, you can hybridize the two protocols in the sense that uh, some of the data you can use for both things, especially with the data you're throwing away for reconciliation. Um, mm. But again, yes, we're not saving anything in terms of logical qubits on the protocols themselves, mm -hmm. except for any information that you may use in the QKD protocol for error correction, because we don't need to do that. Right, sure. All right, thanks. So now obviously the next step is consume the entanglement. So once a message is ready to be encrypted, I've got a QMU, the person I'm trying to securely talk to has a QMU. We then use that to generate our key. So as Nathan said, we might do an authentication handshake first and then we do the actual key um, generation. Um, and then we consume everything that's in our respective QMUs. Then, and this would all be, you know, obviously within the actual device, you would have this all automated. The QMU would then automatically use that key that's generated and reconciled to immediately encrypt the message with strong symmetric encryption or a one-time pad and then immediately destroy the key. So this is a huge part of this that, that does work with other um, QKD systems. So satellites still do it this way and repeaters still do it this way. But it's one of the best things about QKD is that the entire transport infrastructure, especially around a sneaker net, there is no key until the last fraction of a second. And then once you're ready to encrypt and talk to each other, the unit will generate the key, encrypt the message and decrypt the key all within you know, a fraction of a second. And this is of huge consequence in regards to how very, very sensitive key distribution is done now. So a lot of people, you know, John talks a lot, a lot about this when he um, gives his presentations on the quantum internet. You still use basically sneaker net principles for highly sensitive key distribution. Um, they're called trusted courier networks. So in trusted courier networks, you literally load key information onto a hard drive, send that a hard drive off through people that are vetted, highly trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then that's used to encrypt messages at the other end. But this obviously creates huge vulnerabilities. Um, trusted courier networks are only based on the trust of the courier. There's so many failure modes into whether or not the key gets compromised, whether it gets lost, whether it gets copied, um, all that kind of stuff that could actually happen. Whereas in the quantum case, you don't actually generate the key material until the very end. Hell, if this authentication part, if you try and do an authentication by a Bell's theorem and that fails, you just don't generate the key to begin with. Then what happens after that? So I've got these QMUs that are all charged with entanglement. I then use them, I deplete them. So you think of it like a battery um, where the entanglement that you have is analogous to charge. So you've basically depleted the charge of the QMUs and you're ready to recharge. Well, if home base is analogous to the wall socket or the power plant where the initial energy is created, um, in this particular case, you don't need to even charge with home base. You just charge with another unit. So I've used my quantum memory unit. I've got it with me. I'm walking around the place. I see somebody else with their quantum memory unit. It's depleted too. Well, we're going to charge off each other and we're going to create a bell state between our two units or a bunch of bell states between our two units. And then you play, you know, what I like to call the quantum version of six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I move off. I meet a third person. I charge with their memory unit, create a three qubit GHZ state across my entangled system. The other person that I met initially, they talk to somebody else who talks to somebody else who talks to somebody else. And you start building up these very, very complex graph states that can all be manipulated either through measurement or through local complementarity. And you can start distilling certain networking geometries and certain network topologies 
in regards to who you want to communicate with who at a later time. So I sort of spoke about this a little bit before, but if you talk about in the context of QKD, um, what is it hap what's happening in the classical case versus what happens in this particular case, and how does the same attack vectors work with especially a quantum sneak in it? So again, in the classical case, so much of, of it is vulnerable. So if you're trying to transmit keys over the classical network, um, you're either trying to transmit keys directly, which is obviously a huge problem in regards to, to interception over any basically classical network, um, or you're using something like a public key crypto system in order to encrypt keys or whatever, um, which also suffers from the same problem of, is the, is the public key crypto algorithm you're using vulnerable? Again, if we're talking about large scale sneaker net networks, clearly quantum computers exist in some form. So potentially encrypting RSA, uh, encrypting symmetric keys with RSA is probably not a good idea. Um, if you're using trusted couriers, which are a lot of certainly the three letter agencies and, and ministries and departments of defense do, um, again, you have these vulnerability modes. Um, your courier could be captured, the courier could be dodgy and sell and stuff. Um, in other cases, the keys could be copied, they could be compromised in some way. If they simply don't show up to the place where you expected them to show up, um, you have to assume that they're compromised, that the keys have either been copied or um, some other way distributed. And again, if you lose your, your information somehow, either a classical hard drive or a fiber is cut somewhere, you have to assume the worst case scenario is that the keys have been compromised, the keys have been copied, and that's no good for anybody. So in such cases, the key material is rendered useless and any information that happened to have been encrypted or transmitted with the other half of the key pair has to be assumed to be compromised. Um, if they're surreptitiously copied, um, you can't even identify which information could be vulnerable. And of course, because it's a classical hard drive or some other system, it could be copied and you just don't know it's been copied at which point that's a, that's a huge failure mode there. Whereas, as I don't need to spend too much time on this, in the entanglement case, you don't have these issues. Um, if you start playing games with generating more complex, you know, if an eavesdropper is trying to, to tap into the entanglement channel, you know, maybe steals a QMU and then entangles her QMU with the one she's stolen and then somehow gets the, uh, the QMU back to where it's supposed to go without anyone noticing. Um, Again, you can't use that to distill a key because it depends on what Alice does and it depends on what Bob does in terms of measurements and reconciliation. And also it's a bit harder to entangle your QMU by hitting somebody on the head and stealing this physical object and then put it back into circulation without anyone noticing. And again, because you're not generating the keys until you're absolutely sure the attended recipients have got the right entanglement, a lot of this can be overcome. A lot of this can be dealt with in other ways, such that if your QMU just doesn't arrive, then you just don't generate any keys and you certainly don't use them. And with all aspects of quantum technology, well, I think one of the biggest uh, benefits from a security perspective is that you don't make the key at all. You make the key seconds before locking the lock, rather than in the classical case, making the key potentially days, weeks, months or years before you lock the lock. If the key's sitting around, no matter how it's sitting around, it's going to be vulnerable. But in the quantum case, it's not. Again, lost or stolen machines um, is not really a problem in this case. Um, you simply decouple its partner QMU. If you find it later, great. If not, you can still use its partner in the network. Um, and you're not generating a key from those things. And the classical side channel, again, this is true for, for any quantum protocol, but it's quite useful in this context because it's so portable. So you might be using um, QMUs to generate keys across you know, planes, trains and automobiles, whatever you want to do. The classical side channel, channel can be completely unencrypted. You can broadcast however you want to. You know, you put the picture on there, you can broadcast with smoke signals if, uh, if you don't have access to any other classical side channel. And entanglement, as far as we know in quantum mechanics, it isn't blocked by anything. 
So the only impediment to usage is the classical side channel. So as far as we know in physics, you know, sticking one QMU at the bottom of the ocean won't actually stop it from working. You might not be able to have the classical side channel because you're too far under the ocean, but at least the entanglement itself is not blocked. So when I talk about this, especially to defense people, this is sort of the, the, the end point that I sort of speak on. It's imagine replacing you know, these sort of highly secure, highly trusted node um, courier networks with your local FedEx guy without compromising information theoretic security. So this is why we think it's an, an interesting alternative um, to these other technologies. Um, satellites are expensive, they have limited bandwidth, receive, requires fixed receiving stations. Signals can again be trivially blocked because it's a particle stream and does not at the moment distribute persistent quantum entanglement. Nobody's really um, doing anything from a theoretical or experimental side to accept the photon stream coming from the satellites, loading it into some kind of solid state memory um, and seeing how that's going to perform, especially when you have to do distillation protocols or other error correction. Um, free space, again, free space isn't used too much. It was mainly a testing system for eventual satellite quantum communications. Um, it the, has the same issues with satellites. Instead, you replace the expense of putting a satellite into orbit with the fact that obviously you can't do free space transmission um, beyond the horizon. And repeaters, well, repeaters have huge deployability, deployability issues um, because they are mini quantum computers that are supposed to be, while active in their internal operations, otherwise passive and put into very, very hostile environments that it's unclear whether or not that could ever be done across oceans or deserts, for example. Whereas sneaking it on the other hand, we quite like in the fact that you don't need line of sight at all. Once you distribute these memory units, they can go anywhere. It's not blocked. Entanglement is not blocked by any known process that we know of. Um, of course, the classical side channel, you need to be able to broadcast that somehow. But again, that doesn't need to be encrypted. You don't need to worry about security on that. So whatever you can get away with is, is perfectly fine. And entanglement moves with you. So if I have my QMU and I decide to move operations somewhere else or get in the car and go to McDonald's and I want to keep my memory units with me, then the entanglement comes along for the ride. So I'll just put this here for people to read um, rather than go through it um, point by point because we're getting close to the end. Um, we looked at this, um, there was an assessment from GCHQ um, for QKD as, as a practical cryptographic uh, protocol a few years ago and they, they were very critical of it. In fact, they had a, a reassessment uh, only about two or three weeks ago, they still remain highly critical of QKD as a potential cryptographic platform. And they had four major points um, in their initial assessment as to why they were not convinced yet that this thing is, is ready, for, ready for the mainstream. And we believe that Sneakin addresses and uh, potentially solves essentially all of these points um, in regards to whether or not it's, it's ever going to be practical. So take that as, as what you will. So just to put some last numbers onto this kind of thing, and, and, and let's talk about the actual downside of this particular model, because there is a downside, but I'm, what I'm gonna argue is that it's not as bad as it might first appear. So when we initially published um, the idea for this back in 2014, we didn't think of complex networking or anything. Our, our question was how fast and with what fidelity could we possibly have a communication link and over what distance? So this is why we did it in the context of cargo ships. And it's fairly easy to benchmark out. You calculate, given a, a, give a, a physical qubit separation and how many physical qubits you need per chip and how many chips you can put into a unit, how many units you could stick into a shipping container, you can actually estimate what potential bandwidths you could get given the fundamental size or the, the chip separation or the qubit separation in each of your chips. So the one I highlighted in green, this was for the diamond design that I talked about before where you have a qubit separation of about a quarter of a millimeter and all the way to 250 nanometers. So if you start talking about directly coupled diamond or you might even think about potentially one day doing it with silicon. Um, I know Andrew had some great results uh, this week um, uh, pushing the, the temperature of operation of the a silicon system up to four Kelvin, which 
goes a long way to, to potentially making their systems portable too. And we looked at a 10,000 kilometer transport link, so basically Japan to the United States, um, on what's known as a VLCS class container ship. So these are very large cargo container ships. They carry about 10,000 shipping containers. So if you can push qubit separations and have quite dense memory units, and you utilize the entire ship, you can have a continuously running 1.5 terahertz link across the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is at the fidelity of four nines, assuming a round trip time of the boat of 40 days. And this is the only model proposed that can reach these kind of distances at these operational fidelities and at these rates. Repeaters can't do it, satellites can't do it, at least no models that I've ever seen um, could suggest that they get up to these rates. But here, it's purely a function of how many of these units can you build that gives you these kind of rates. So the obvious downside to all of this is we need a shitload of qubits. We need an absolute massive number of qubits to do this kind of thing. So as you see back in the slide, if you're talking about the 250 nanometer separation of the physical qubits, each of the quantum memory units could be storing up to a petabyte of quantum equivalent. So 10 to the 15 actual qubits. So obviously, is this even possible? Are we even talking about something sensible when we're talking about those kind of physical qubit numbers? Well, we kind of are because the entire quantum field basically assumes that these kind of qubit numbers are going to happen. So this is where we come back to cost and why cost cannot be tomorrow's problem. It does not do me any good if I have, say, a superconducting or a silicon-based quantum computer in a dilution refrigeration system that costs half a million dollars and the chipset can contain 50 qubits at most. This is why this is a problem. Either I have to figure out a way to get more chips into the mixing chamber or more qubits into the mixing chamber, or I have to figure out a way to build dilution refrigeration systems at an order of magnitude to maybe three orders of magnitude cheaper than they currently are. So cost is relevant whether we're talking about computing or whether we're talking about communication. So these are just some numbers from Craig Gidney's paper from last year looking at short 2048 factoring and the Microsoft paper from 2017 looking at um, nitrogen fixation for quantum simulation. And based on the number of physical qubits that they need to do these tasks, what are we talking about in terms of cost per qubit? Are we talking $1,000 per qubit? Which would be optimistic today because each qubit costs a lot more than $1,000 depending on your platform. Well, if we're talking $1,000 a qubit, quantum computers are like the LHC or are like LIGO. We're only gonna build a couple of them globally. Or are we talking about sub $1 a qubit? At which point it might be ubiquitous technology. Now, certainly everyone's assuming that it's gonna be in a ubiquitous technology, but if you're gonna make these assumptions, I think we need to have a serious discussion about where costs are now and how you get them down. Even if you can't do it right now, what is the pathway forward to reduce costs, especially for quantum computing systems that have high infrastructure costs, such as vacuums, dilution systems, um, high powered, very, very well controlled laser systems, for example, all of these things that are bulky capital expenses. Now, a lot of people make this sort of distinction as to sort of the costs of transistors. This is just a plot we did up a while back showing how it's dropped um, over the decades. Transistors now are extremely, extremely cheap. Um, you know, hopefully one day qubits will get to this point or the cost per qubit will get down to something that's at least sub $1. I'd like to think they go the same way as transistors, but maybe that's being a bit optimistic. But if they go down to these kind of numbers, then volume's not an issue and suddenly something like sneaking out at the global scale becomes possible. And finally, sneaking it gives you the ability to change your application as you scale the system. So as I said, there are various applications that sort of kick in as I have more and more of these units deployed. The first one is authentication, where you need about 50 units to do a single bell violation over long distance um, for an authentication token. So this would come in as sort of the first application where you don't even do cryptography. Then you start generating keys, for symmetric protocols. So you then could move to one-time pads. You then could move to direct communication, classical communication over quantum channels. And then you can push further and further and say, okay, what does a quantum internet look like where I'm connecting two quantum computers together? 
or in the case of photonic quantum computing, this is a model that we're working on now called the distillery model. Um, as some of you people may know, doing non-Clifford gates for a quantum computer is actually quite tricky. You need a lot of resources to do a state distillation for these non-Clifford gates. So what if you as a customer don't buy all the hardware you need for a fully fault tolerant error corrected computer? You build sort of, you buy sort of the core qubits you need, say Shaw's algorithm, and you rent these ancillary states off me. And I've got this huge distillery that's just pumping these states out and loading them onto QMUs and I send them out and you rent them off me. You take a QMU that contains a hundred or a thousand T states, uh, what we call A states for T gates, you use them, you send the QMUs back and you do it that way. But all of these things just kick in as more and more units are produced. I might start off with a hundred units, I build an authentication link, then maybe two years later, I've built a thousand units. Okay, now I can start doing keys or I've built a million units. Now I can start doing one time pads and stuff like that. So I think I'm gonna leave it there. Um, there were some slides just at the end. I was just had a few things talking about what currently exists for classical infrastructure. We spent a lot of money on it, um, hacking together sort of fiber optics, satellites, free space, Wi-Fi all this kind of stuff together. And I still think that there is um, a bit of a, there is a place for these other technologies. I'm certainly not saying that SneakerNet replaces satellites and replaces repeaters. I'm saying it's an element within what is possibly a global infrastructure later down the track. So aside from that, I think I'll uh, leave it there. So thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any questions for Simon? Just uh, unmute yourself and um, and ask away. Hi, Simon. JP here. Hey, JP. Um, a couple questions. Um, has Has anyone yet tried to make a kind of like a portable qubit with NV Sanus, you know? You know? Um, as in- No. Yeah. No, not yet. Um, I know Marcus down at ANU, I mean, his, his company Quantum Brilliance is certainly moving down this track because they're doing it. Right. They're, they basically want to build a five qubit quantum computer for sort of educational purposes. And they're arguing that they can do it at room temperature, which is probably true. They could probably build five qubits that function at room temperature, uh, which case they want to sell it as an educational tool or a, an industry tool to sort of do training and stuff like that on. So my guess is that they've got portability in mind. Right. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, well, like once you make something kind of packaged and portable, what the implications were in terms of um, preserving the fidelity and stuff. Um, I think yeah, I mean, people have, I mean, it depends what you mean in the sense of people with NVs in the lab, they're portable to the level that any lab experiment is portable. I mean, you could stick it in a box if you want to spend six months sticking it in a box. Yeah. Little motivation for them to do it yet. Yeah. I mean, the NV sensors, the magnetometry sensors, the, or maybe they are packaged for magnetometry already well i think they're they're not operate they're not operated in sort of the computational qubit sense yeah exactly yeah um the other one question i had i, I kind of missed the your explanation on how the qmus are rechargeable um so I, I understand that you can ship pairs of qmus that have several um entangled links to them and so you start using up those resources but then did you, were you implying that then you can, to recharge them, do you have to get new ones shipped over or can you get the ones that you already had somehow recharged? I, I missed that. No. Oh, no, no, no. The, the, the hardware that you have is, is you, when you use the entanglement, you don't kill the hardware. What right. you're doing is effective. You, you're, you're measuring out the qubits. So obviously they're not entangled with whatever they were entangled with. 
But if I send them back to home base or if I meet you and you have a depleted unit, then we just hook them up again. We just fiber connections, hook them up, create more bell states between the two. So the hardware is completely reusable. Yeah, sure. But, but you, need, uh, you need the new entangled resources to be shipped uh, to you again, right? It's not, it's well, not it, dep it, depends, it depends on who you want to communicate with. Yes, if I want to communicate with home base again, right. then I need to ship them back to home base and re-entangle them and ship them out again. But this is what I was talking about with this sort of quantum version of six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I could, I could get there via a different route because if I've met you, you know, I don't have to necessarily take my units all the way back home. I could meet you who's talked to somebody else, who's talked to somebody else, who talked to home base. And then I can run entanglement swapping protocols down that entire chain to get back home. Cool. Thanks. Uh, just just a comment on Andrew's experiment this week was one and a half Kelvin, not four. So still a waste, but it was still um, very impressive nonetheless. <laughs> yes, I assume is one and a half and four. Where's the boundary before I start having to go to dill? Uh, so you can, you still need to kind of pump heal. You can, you can just use helium four to get to one and a half, but you still need to pump it. So you need a closed system. It's slightly larger, but it's it's a lot more manageable than than a dilution refrigerator for sure. No, so, yeah. it's not a standard pulse tube compressor, though. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's got another four Kelvin to go. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Cheers. Um, okay, so I think uh, since um, we're, we're a bit over time anyway, I think we'll, we'll end it there. And uh, thank you, Simon, once again. And if you missed anything, this will be on YouTube in perpetuity. Uh, we'll have to go back and uh, take out all the swearing anyway. That's a joke. Uh <laughs> I think I only swore once to <laughs> All right, thanks Simon. Okay, cheers everyone. Yeah, great.